Uh, so, good evening and welcome to Oxford for Europe's fourth virtual meeting. I can see that we currently now have over 200, 205 people and uh, they're still coming in. So, we're, we're well over the 200 mark for participants, which is great to see you all. Uh, I see that we've you've come from all over Europe, definitely. Dublin, Luxembourg, I saw, uh, amongst all the hellos. So, uh, welcome to you all. Yes. The title of tonight's meeting is Brexit, Expectations and Reality, and we're pleased, very pleased to welcome our two speakers, uh, Jonathan Liss and Tony Connolly. Uh, each will speak for about 15 minutes, then we'll open up the meeting to a Q&A session. So it'll be uh, half an hour speaking and then Q&A. Um, and the theme of the discussion tonight is that now that the transition period has ended and we are 26 days into it, whatever it is, How's it going so far? Uh, so on to the main uh, meet of the evening, which is to welcome our two speakers, um, Jonathan and Tony. Tony is going to be speaking first. He is an eminent journalist who's reported on conflicts around the world from Rwanda to Ukraine. He's now the Europe editor for RTE, I I Ireland's public broadcaster. And he's received many prestigious awards, both for his coverage of Brexit and many previous EU issues, including the refugee crisis, the Greek debt crisis and the Irish bailout. He's also co-presenter of the podcast Brexit Republic, which most recently included an interview with Michel Barnier of, um, uh, of renown, uh, in which it was exclusively revealed that Monsieur Barnier is going to be writing a book about the Brexit negotiations, a publication which I think we can all anticipate and dread in equal measure. So, Tony, without further ado, welcome. Thank you for being with us and over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, and thanks for Peter and all the organisers. And it's uh, fantastic to be talking tonight to I was going to say a group from Oxford, but of course, uh, the uh, audience is from far afield, which is great as well. I see Anne Hegarty from Derry, my hometown as well, which is uh, heartwarming. If, if I get nervous, I know that there's a Derry supporter out there uh, looking out for me. Um, I also would like to say that my very first job as a journalist was in Oxford. Uh, I worked for the Oxford Courier for a year way back in the late 80s, believe it or not. Um, around about the time when uh, Inspector Morse was uh, a huge uh, hit on TV and of course my first assignment was to call um, the Oxford Police Station and check uh, if Oxford Morse had, uh, if Inspector Morse had any comment to make on a particular crime, um, which of course I did and uh, learned my lesson. But um, anyway, it's great to be talking to you all tonight and we are, yes, a number of weeks into uh, Brexit reality. And I suppose in terms of the title, expectations versus reality, I suppose everybody had, uh, a lot of different people had different expectations. And I think it's fair to say that the majority of UK exporters probably believe that the reality they're facing now is different from what they expected. And I think there was, an, there was a belief that if you did get a free trade agreement over the line before Christmas, even if it was late in the day, then life would not be too bad. Um, and yes, they did. And it is on paper a, a good free trade agreement. People say that, uh, who are trade experts, zero tariffs, uh, zero quotas. But um, th there's an awful lot of reality behind the, those headlines. And there are a lot of um, non-tariff barriers. There's a lot of confusion about rules of origin. There's a lot of confusion about VAT. Uh, and companies are really struggling to get to grips with the paperwork, with the, the, the expense. And this is happening on a number of fronts. It's happening for companies exporting into the EU mainland or companies exporting to, to Northern Ireland. And of course, under the Irish protocol, Northern Ireland is still operating the rules of the EU single market and customs union. Uh, and one by one, we are seeing real world examples of companies that simply are going to stop trading in Northern Ireland from the UK, from GB. Um, and likewise, uh, companies in GB are going to stop exporting to the EU. And I think this is probably the most insidious aspect of this. Um, not that companies couldn't overcome the difficulties of the paperwork, the expense, the rules of origin, the uh, all the other non-tariff barriers, but it just isn't worth their while. And I think this will be 
uh, very sad and very difficult for a lot of uh, SMEs as well, small and medium-sized uh, companies. Um, those of you know people in European capitals and in Brussels are probably looking on and saying, well, what did you expect? Um, this is what Brexit uh, brings about. This is the reality of Brexit. And I suppose uh, people looking at this in a very um, hard-headed, cold-eyed way will say that, you know, this is not, this is no surprise. Um, it may be a surprise to UK exporters, but it's not a surprise to people who understand the single market and who understand that the EU was not really going to uh, completely overturn its rule book or compromise beyond its means uh, to suit a UK government that, yes, wanted out of the single market and customs union, but still wanted to almost uh, tunnel its way back in uh, to the EU. Um, the problems now being faced by people in the UK and Europe as well. I mean, European companies are having difficulty exporting into the UK. These are a result of the choices that the UK government made in terms of avoiding um, any kind of alignment with EU rules and cleaving um, as an article of faith to the idea of sovereignty. So you could say that the UK government has got what it asked for, uh, more or less. Um, there's no role for the European Court of Justice. They are not going to be involved in dynamic alignment with EU rules. Uh, yes, there are mechanisms there for the EU to take retaliatory action if the UK diverges from EU standards uh, or agreed standards. Um, but the UK does have a fair degree of discretion uh, on in terms of how it operates. Um, that's for goods. Uh, services is different. They services part of the free trade agreement is widely regarded as quite poor. UK companies uh, have done very well in the EU in terms of uh, architectural services, um, engineering services, a whole range of services that UK companies have offered. But the prize there is very uh, elusive, I think, uh, in this free trade agreement. So where does that leave us um, in terms of what, what happens next? Um, as you know, the free trade agreement was concluded really at the last minute. I mean, initially the UK wanted a deadline of the um, uh, middle of October. The EU's deadline was end of October, beginning of November. Of course, it ran all the way up to Christmas Eve. Um, and that meant the treaty had to be provisionally applied. Uh, the EU European Parliament hasn't ratified it. The treaty hasn't been translated properly. Um, and then when the translations happen, they will have to be legally scrubbed to make sure the translations are coherent, uh, that they mean what they say. Uh, and for that reason, the European Union is going to seek a, an extension of provisional application until the middle of April. Uh, originally, both sides had agreed that the treaty would be ratified at the end of February. Um, but that, that's not going to happen because they need more time. But the, the, the extension is not just for the European Parliament to ratify or the translations to be done. What we're seeing now in, in Brussels is member states really getting to grips with the treaty. And they appear determined to make sure that they will be in the driving seat in terms of how this treaty is implemented and managed by both sides. Typically, the European Commission would be the custodian of a free trade agreement with a third country, and the Commission's you know, vast uh, um, DG trade division would uh, keep tabs on how things are going and decide if there's a breach or if things are fine. Um, member states have been worried that if they foresaw or if they identified a divergence in standards that affected a particular sector in their country that they might say to the European Commission, actually, we think this is harmful. We need to trigger retaliation. And the Commission said, well, we've looked at it and we don't think there's a problem. Member states are now insisting that you know, that approach is not going to be good enough. Um, the, the member states want to be really there with their, their hands on levers so that if they're 
is anything that they don't like, then they can make sure their voice is heard. Um, and that's a new departure for the EU. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's a reflection again of how unique this, this new relationship is and this free trade agreement is. Um, uh, as you may know, there's a thing called the Joint uh, Partnership Council, which is the glue that brings both sides together to implement the treaty. Um, and the, I suppose one of the first decisions it will have to make is to extend the provisional application. And that's why the EU was very quick to appoint Maros Shevchevich, who's a vice president of the commission, um, a Slovak uh, diplomat and politician. And he is going to be the EU's chair on the Joint Partnership Council. He's already on the chair of the, the, chair of the uh, Joint Committee, which, of course, implements the, um, the uh, withdrawal agreement. Um, so the Joint Partnership Council is going to be the overarching uh, political body managing the agreement. But that, that's to do strictly with the... Um, the, the, the goods and the services and, and the other aspects of the agreement, the wider EU-UK relationship actually doesn't have any legal or political apparatus beyond that for both sides to just guide their relationship uh, into the future. And I think that's going to be a critical problem. And, you know, already we have seen... Uh, issues flare up over the EU embassy or the EU delegation status in, in the UK. We've seen the terrible politicization of the vaccine issue. Uh, and that's, you know, as someone said today, um, vaccine Twitter is now worse than Brexit Twitter. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's something I would agree with. Um, you know, the, 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 there is no forum for both sides to discuss those kinds of political issues which are outside the remit of the basic free trade agreement. And I think that's going to be a problem. Um, the whole question of security, police and judicial cooperation. Yes, there are provisions in there for both sides to cooperate, but obviously they're not as good as EU membership. Um, there, there's a big absence in terms of the UK's strategic uh, and defence ambitions uh, outside, you know, beyond Brexit. Um, the UK is going to be bringing out its own strategic and defence and uh, foreign and um, development policy. It's going to bring out a big, a big new integrated policy uh, in, in the next weeks or months. I think the EU wants to wait for that to appear before they uh, take any big decisions on trying to see where the UK wants to cooperate or collaborate uh, or not. Um, so we are now in a situation where the reality is there, reality bites. Um, there's been a clamor by UK trading uh, organizations, the Food and Drink Federation, the fisheries organizations, obviously, for easements, for facilitations. And there's certainly a mood in the European Commission and in other capitals that uh, this is what the UK asked for. They're just going to have to get used to this new reality. But I think behind that particular posture at the moment. I think the EU will probably look for things that can be helped around the margins. And I think they will want to make sure that the, the, you know, the systems in the UK are adapting, that supply chains are adapting, that the market is adapting, because certainly th there's a view that you know life can't go on the way it was. The, the UK can't be a distribution hub for Ireland the way it was before. And we've had a, a very acute problem facing Irish retailers in that goods were coming from say the Netherlands or France, uh, be it uh, chocolate confectionery products or, or wine. Um, you know, historically the UK and Ireland would be treated as kind of one consumer market for those kinds of goods. We have similar tastes, there's a language issue. And stuff would be sent uh, in bulk to a UK warehouse. Parts of it would be boxed off and sent to Ireland, uh, north and south, and that was all fine. Now we're discovering that if you even take stuff out of a box, that means the goods are in free circulation. And that means they lose their EU origin status. And when they are then shipped on to, to Ireland, um, they get hit for tariffs. 
Um, and that's been a big shock to the UK Food and Drink Federation and a big shock to, to Irish retailers. Now, of course, there are ways around that. You can have the goods sent by transit. So they're in a sealed truck when they leave the Netherlands go across the UK land bridge and then over to Dublin. Um, but that's not necessarily uh, cost effective or uh, available to everybody. Um, transit is expensive. You need to have a, a financial guarantee. Another solution would be to make sure everything's shipped directly by ferry from France or uh, the Netherlands um, or Belgium. I'm not sure if there's a Belgian route yet. Um, but again, that's not going to work for everybody. And it's, uh, it's going to be tricky for um, companies that send food, for example, uh, for, for perishability. So, you know, we, we, are go- we are going to see a wrenching adaptation to the new reality. And that's going to be painful for a lot of people. It's going to be painful for Irish um, retailers. And, it's, and of course, very important to point out that at the moment, the friction is is mainly on the UK to the to EU uh, and GB to Northern Ireland. Um, in the other direction, of course, after you know be- between four and six months, the UK is going to start phasing in its controls. So you know we're we're in for a long haul of disruption and friction and and unpleasantness and. Um, you know, how that resonates politically in the UK, I'll, I'll leave that for Jonathan to, to explore. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is there and it is very painful for a lot of people. And for Northern Ireland in particular, it's not just painful for consumers and businesses. There's a, there's a real political, uh, almost sectarian side to this in that if the protocol and the new Brexit reality doesn't get popular approval or if people don't reconcile themselves to it or simply adapt to it, then you could have uh, a situation where the Northern Ireland Assembly votes to, to reject parts of the protocol in uh, four years time. And then we're back at square one. We're back to the start of what to do with the Irish border. And that's a problem nobody really wants to uh, confront. So I'll leave it there and uh, hand back to Anne and, um, then I'm happy to take uh, questions when, when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, I've uh, quite a few phrases in there that I've picked up. Wrenching adaptation. That uh, sounds something like we're all going to have to get used to. And going back to square one in four years is something we definitely don't 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 relish at all. Uh, so moving on to our second speaker, Jonathan Liss, who is steeped in all things EU. He's a political writer and commentator and was in an earlier uh, manifestation senior assistant to a Conservative MEP, so working directly uh, with the European Parliament, specialising in human rights. He then went on to work for UNPO, an international organisation working to empower the marginalised peoples of the world, so again, very much human rights based. He is now Deputy Director of a think tank called British Influence, which was founded in 2012 to make the case for Britain remaining within the EU and which has subsequently moved through the same several stages of grief that I think we've all been subjected to, including advocating for a soft Brexit and advocating for a referendum, and is now concentrating its efforts on maintaining the closest possible ties with the EU. Jonathan is, uh, uh, writes um, widely for the media, including for The Guardian and for Huffington Post, and also appears um, on broadcast media from Al Jazeera to the BBC. So I look forward to um, all of his comments. And Jonathan, with that, many thanks for being here. And I hand over to you. Well, thanks very much, Anne. And uh, thanks uh, for inviting me. And thanks to everyone for, for coming. Uh, obviously, there are lots of other things that people uh, could be doing with their Tuesday evenings, theatre, cinema, etc. But I'm glad that you decided to come here. Um, so, uh, Tony, that was a brilliant um, presentation. And, you know, I think that the first thing to say is that Ireland, um, as so often in the last 800 years, is bearing the brunt of British decision making, um, which it has not asked for. So uh, that's kind of, you know, we asked for this, not the people in this room, but the majority of the British people will have voted in 2016, not in 2019, lest lest we forget, because 52% of people in the election voted for parties 
the reader in favour of a referendum or remaining outright. But under our system, obviously, that's not how it worked. And there was a huge mandate to leave the EU um, in December 2019. I think we all have to accept that. And so we have got what we asked for. And as predicted by many of us, it's not a lot of fun. And it's going to get even less fun as the months and years wear on. So we'll get onto what that might mean. Um, just on the second point that Tony mentioned about vaccines, um, you know, it's if there is a kernel of truth, if there, there is tr this is the truth in the story that the EU is, you know, is kind of acting as many what many people in Britain might consider to be poorly. Um, the the lesson of that is that the EU has always acted aggressively in the interests of its own members. I think a lot of Remainers made the mistake that the EU is some kind of cuddly organisation that kind of wraps its arms around the world. It's not. It never has been. It, it acts for its members and there's power in, in, its, in its size. And that was one of the reasons to be in it. And now we're feeling the cold on the outside of the EU. We're smaller, we're less rich, we're less powerful. We're the junior partner, the very junior partner. And it's about time that we acted like it because we are not the equal of the EU. And that is going to be another lesson of the, of the future, just as the lesson of the last 70 years, which British prime ministers have never really grasped is that we're the junior partners of the US, very much a junior partner. The special relationship is, is a unilateral one. And the irony of the UK EU relationship is that the UK is a junior partner and it also doesn't want to have a special relationship, but it is the most important relationship we have. So going on to the deal, um, the first thing to say, as Tony alluded to, was that the transition period was meant to be 21 months. So it was meant to be, so as the transition period, as envisaged and agreed by Theresa May, was to last for 21 months, and that was to implement a deal that had already been agreed. That was to give business the time to adjust to the new reality. Now, that implementation period, in the end, lasted three working days from Christmas from Christmas onwards to New Year's Eve. So a serious country does not do this. So we can establish for the, you know, from the get-go that this is not how a serious country would have acted in the interest of its citizens. But that's kind of a, you know, that's done now. But the second point is that, you know, obviously there was a limited amount, there was some, there were some things that business could have done. To, to better adjust, there was more information the government could have given with more time. But as Tony was saying, the problems of this deal are baked in. So you could have had five years to adjust to this and the result would have been the same, which is the business has been shafted because you know all of the things which, which we took for granted, being in the single market, being in the customs union, we no longer have those privileges. So really it's about completely adjusting our way of doing trade you know, a lot of other aspects of life as well, but the way of doing trade. So, you know, supply chains, you know, being cut or rerouted, the way that we do business, um, just the EU is no longer an easy place to do business with. So as we expected, this has been very, very difficult um, because let's just, you know, take one example, fisheries, um, which obviously received a huge amount of attention um, in the last couple of months, when the government effectively, through manufacturing and services under the boss, to save Britain's fishers, and three weeks on, uh, Britain's fishing industries are collapsing. So that's kind of the, the tragic irony of the situation, that having expended all this political capital to rescue Britain's fisheries, Britain's fisheries are now kind of collapsing in front before us. The reason for that is, the issue has never been access to our waters, which is a kind of a jingoistic symbolic totem. It's about the fish that we sell to. So if you can't, you can, you know, you can have the, the rights to fish every single bit of stock in your waters, but you can't force the British people to eat it. And that's a fundamental problem. So the people who want to eat it happen to be in the EU. So I wrote an article in 2018 explaining how, never mind the common fisheries policy, but how leaving the single market and customs union would bring disaster to Britain's fisheries because outside the customs union, you have rules of origin, uh, which would impact on Britain's fish processing, which is actually 75% of the industry. And outside the single market, you have non-tariff barriers. So whether that's labeling, VAT, 
um, SPS checks. So that is why I said that, you know, you'd have fish rotting at the ports, and that has proven to be the case. Now, for any government minister to say that these problems were unforeseen, I'm afraid they're simply lying. If someone like me, who was simply conducting some desk research for an article in 2018, could have predicted what's going to happen, then the senior officials in Whitehall and in Downing Street could and should have known. So this is a fundamental dereliction of duty by the British government. Um, but it was a choice that was made. The choice that was made was to leave those instruments um, in favour of an abstract notion of sovereignty. And now we're finding out what that actually means. So to turn to the government then, Boris Johnson sort of made the extraordinary statement, which is a scripted statement on Christmas Eve, that there'll be no non-tariff barriers. Now, as any trader or traveller will find out, that is obviously not true. There are literally thousands of new non-tariff barriers which are, which are coming up everywhere, and they are going to cripple massive aspects of our trade. So obviously Johnson said famously, F business, and now I'm afraid he has. So that's one promise he's actually kept. Um, so he said something really important as well. He said that Britain's, he said that when he, when he was kind of presenting this cakeish treaty, which he said the word cakeish treaty, he said that um, the critics, his critics had always said, you couldn't have free trade without following the EU's rules. And he seemed to be saying that he'd proven them wrong. But of course, that was absolutely right. You can't have fully free trade if you don't follow the EU's rules. We don't have free trade right now. It's a free trade agreement, but as we've established, it's not free. And if we diverge from the EU's rules, that will incur retaliatory tariffs in the EU and make that trade, trade even less free. So we're looking at no good options here. We're either looking at this, this level of trade now or more independence, quote unquote, which results in, in even more obstacles to trade with our largest trade partner. So obviously the government, what's the government's doing now is it's blaming COVID for the problem. So Brandon Lewis, Northern Ireland Secretary, had the audacity to tell Northern Irish MPs that the Northern Irish supermarket shelves were empty because of COVID. Now that is taking everyone for fools. And it had the extraordinary impact of um, uniting Northern Ireland's politicians. So I think you know, what, you might, what you might find with this deal is that it first unites Northern Ireland and then unites Ireland afterwards. Because what you're now seeing is Northern Ireland deeply within the, the EU's and Ireland's obviously economic orbit. So it is now easier for Northern Ireland to trade with Bulgaria than it is with Britain. And now see that, that will have profound constitutional implications for the country. Um, so, you know, the, the, the other thing with that is that when the UK diverges, any divergence from the EU will also be a divergence from Northern Ireland. So the, the, the fissure, which currently ex exists between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is going to get deeper. And that is, I think, going to be one of the big stories of the next 10 to 15 years, along with Scottish independence, which I now think is a racing certainty. And we can discuss the implications of that more in the, in the, you know, the discussion, because that will obviously mean a hard border. And so all the arguments about Ireland are going to be kind of, kind of superimposed onto the Scotland debate, because in a Scottish referendum, whereas in 2014, it was all about the pound, in 20, whatever it is, it'll be about the, the hard border. And the government won't be able to have, the UK government won't be able to say anything to that because as we've established in this brave new world, economics are not the most important factor. It's about sovereignty. It's about independence. Uh, if the government cared about borders and economic obstacles, they wouldn't have done anything that they have done in the last five years. And if they cared about the union, they would have listened to the Scottish government in 2016 when they very sensibly and reasonably, magnanimously, uh, have been, you know, the Scottish people voted overwhelmingly to remain by a bigger margin than the votes to remain in the UK. And they proposed having a single market as a, as a compromise. That was dismissed by Theresa May out of hand. So the Scottish people have been shown a huge degree of contempt by the UK government. And I think that will also have massive economic and constitutional implications. 
Um, I'm aware that I'm already running out of time. I thought that I wouldn't have enough to say, but I barely started. Um, so I guess I should probably um, wrap up there. I was going to talk more about how levers will kind of move on from here um, and how remainers will move on, what the next subjects are for that. So I'm very happy to talk about that in the discussion about where the next steps are and about the prospects for where we go rejoining or rejoining the single market, or whatever it is. But I suppose I'll just finish by saying that this is going to be a difficult relationship. It's going to be highly acrimonious. Um, you know, former French ambassador to the UK, I think, tweets today that it's going to be a very acrimonious relationship and hostile relationship. And, you know, I, you could quit. Well, why change the habit of 60 years? But obviously, this is a serious problem for Britain, which has never been more isolated. You know, Biden thinks of Johnson as being Britain Trump. Um, he has bigger fish to fry. The EU is in no mood to kind of uh, make nice with this uh, troublesome island off its coast. And so Britain has a real problem and a real choice to make about we cannot afford to alienate the EU by the whole diplomatic row that's raging at the moment about whether Britain should be the only country in the world not to grant the EU embassy full diplomatic status is extraordinary. Um, that is, it's just the, the UK signed the Lisbon Treaty which enshrined the EU, you know, the, the EEAS and the EU Diplomatic Service, which to which Britain contributed many great ambassadors, by the way. And it's completely extraordinary and self-defeating that we're now kind of relegating the state of the EU mission in London. It, it's, there's, it's just, it's a sign to the world that we're still, we still don't want to be taken seriously. We're still picking childish fights. And it also sends a terrible signal to Washington. Um, so really, this is a tragedy, as we know. But a fundamental tragedy is that um, we have romanticized for 75 years our relationships with the US and the Commonwealth. And we've treated Europe, which is a vehicle, the greatest vehicle for influence with defensiveness or disdain. And that is, shows all signs of continuing now. So it's time to, sorry, that was a, um, so it's time to really kind of address the reality of where we are, to think about what we, do from now on and to be for the first time in many years pragmatic about the situation and to accept that we don't have to accept um, this poor economic outcome if we don't want to. So there are, we, we mustn't be despondent, we must be realistic and pragmatic but not despondent because if we can, if enough people can see this isn't working there'll be pressure to change that relationship and I think that could be the story of the next 20 or so years. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was quite depressing, but with a little uplift at the end. Um, yes, it's interesting to see the EU, it almost looks like it's changed its spots from our perspective, i.e. they were being very, very accommodating up until the, the, fair, the fair trade agreement was signed, free trade agreement. Uh, and now you can already see, as you described, that they are aggressively acting for its members, of which we are no longer one. So I'm going to um, uh, hand over now to uh, Peter and Susan and anyone else who's been picking up questions from the chat. Uh, so I'm going to go quiet and ask them to provide uh, questions for Tony and Jonathan. Uh, thank you both. Fantastic presentations. We're absolutely inundated with questions. Uh, the first one I wanted to ask was one from Michael Hocken, which is really to do with where do we go from here? And in particular, he says... Um, what big issues do you see that still remain to be resolved in relation to uh, individual UK citizens and res residents' rights and their relationship with the EU? And secondly, UK business and trade. And can I ask maybe supplementary to that is realistically, how much wiggle room is there given that um, Barnier says it's all, it's all now copper fastened? Uh, is there room for further negotiation and, and in what way can that happen? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, the mantra seems to be that the, the deal is done, um, Brexit means Brexit, and, and this is what you ask for. Um, yet there's a clamour, as, as I mentioned before, for easements, facilitations. Um, when I spoke to Michel Barnier last week, uh, I interviewed him for, for RT television, and, and we ran the whole thing in the podcast. You know, I did put some of these points to him, and he said, all of those things, Brexit means Brexit, people have to get used to this. But he did say, well, when with the Northern Ireland Protocol, we did 
address some of the issues that the British government had to implement the protocol, to, to make it workable, to, to make life as you know, bearable as, as possible on the ground in Northern Ireland. And of course, so long as it doesn't contradict the treaty, we can find solutions. Um, now, I think there's a door is open there for, for further um, conversations about, about how things you know, might be managed. But I, I don't think they are going to be wholesale rewritings or, you know, any kind of turning a blind eye or um, disregarding the rules. I mean, member states are naturally extremely jealous and vigilant about the, the integrity of the single market, and they don't want to do anything that's going to um, to put that at risk, especially with food security and, and consumer protection. That is a key um, article of faith for, for European uh, member states. Um, I mean, I, ju- I would just make a couple of observations on the vaccine issue, which is obviously really boiling at the moment. I, w- I thought it was interesting that the UK media and, and the government interpreted what was said yesterday by the European Commission as a threat to block exports um, of vaccines outside the EU to third countries. Um, I mean, I, I don't see that that's what they're doing. They're, they're clearly worried about this AstraZeneca problem. They feel furious that it seems that they have been singled out for, uh, for punishment. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a 60% shortfall in doses, which is a, a massive body blow to the European effort to catch up with vaccinations. And there's huge political anger and dismay behind this. And they, they, they feel genuinely that the company hasn't explained why it seems that the UK has got all of its doses, yet the EU, which poured hundreds of billions into the contracts, uh, have, have been treated in this way. Now, we're all talking in a bit of a vacuum here because none of us have seen the contract we don't know what obligations pertain to both sides. Um, but I think what was said yesterday and today is, is basically a warning shot to companies that they need to start fixing this. Otherwise, they, they will want to see where these vaccines are, go- these doses are going and who's getting what. I don't see the EU really blocking vaccines going to the UK. The other thing I'd say about the the EU's approach to this is that, you know, it, it's, it's people have said, well, why, did, why didn't Germany and France just buy their own vaccines? Um, there is a single market. There's free movement of people, free movement of businesses. There's no point in Germany buying up all the vaccines and then healing itself if Poland and Hungary and Slovakia are all sick. Um, I mean, the, the, the idea behind this is that the single market gets recovered as a whole member states couldn't afford to buy some member states couldn't have afforded to buy all the vaccines or get them all at the time they needed them so it was felt that the eu would go in as a as a as a whole and buy uh, negotiate contracts for everybody now the other thing to say about that is the eu's never done that before um public health is a is not an eu competence so this was kind of thrust into the hands of the commission and they may have made a balls of it. We don't know. We'll find out. Um, but uh, again, it's, I think it's just terrible that this thing has been so politicized and there's so much point scoring about who, who's saving how many deaths compared to which country. Um, and I think that's, it's really got the relationship off to a very bad start uh, in terms of Brexit just having happened. Yeah, I kind of think that Tony asked all the points. So, can happy to happy to move on to the next question. Well, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'll take the next question, and um, it comes from uh, Dominic Jackson, but it's actually a question that has come in in lots of different forms, and it's, uh, it's asking the panelists how they see political developments and public opinion building and changing as the year progresses, and is December twenty. 20- 21 likely to look at all like January 2012 and if I can go one little bit further onto that is what should remainers stroke rejoiners 
be trying to do during this year to ensure that perhaps December 2021 looks a bit different to January 2021. So to give Tony a wee break, if I go to you first, Jonathan. I mean, after the last five years we've had, I think you're a fool to engage in too much political uh, projections. Uh, we simply don't know what the, out what the outlook will be um, at the end, you know, in, in five months, let alone, you know, in 2024, when the next election comes, which is obviously the really important milestone, which obviously is also coinciding with the moment where uh, the EU and UK have, have agreed to look at this deal. Um, so I think that there are, there are many different options. You know, we could find that the, the media begins to look more into what's happening on Brexit, because obviously at the moment, it's down the agenda. You have COVID as obviously the right so is the most important political issue, which is taking up the, the bandwidth and the attention. And you know, in this month you also had Trump and Biden, which which obviously also leapfrogged Brexit as the key issue. And a lot of people who aren't directly affected by um, the supply chains issue are kind of thinking that this just has indeed been done and we can move on to other things. So trying to get people's attention is going to be difficult. I think that the more that people, when we begin traveling to the EU again, uh, and we see that that's going to be difficult, when people start engaging in cross-border trade, whether that's kind of taking parcels, you know, as a lot of people do, if people have relatives or, you know, so they can't get to the same services uh, as they did as they when they're in the EU as, as they do here, I think that will be it will be a slow burn where people start to think what's going on this isn't what we voted for and you know as more and more businesses suffer and it'll be small businesses um who are the least able to absorb the shocks here and i think the media might begin to take an interest in those stories these are the people you know this small and medium enterprises voted for brexit not as a majority but more of them voted for brexit than big multinationals and so once they kind of feel that they're the little man yet again has been screwed over, I think that that will could become you know, a running issue. What that means for public opinion, I don't know. But, you know, there are some people speculating on, you know, social media that the single market, it might be coming sooner than we think. I think that's optimistic. Um, but I do think that we are now facing a kind of a return to 2018, 2019, where the big argument amongst Remainers was, do we stay in the single market? Do we stay in the EU via a second referendum? Or do we opt for the Norway option? And a lot of people, you know, changed their, their attitudes on this. Obviously, in 2016, 2017, we were arguing very strongly for a soft Brexit option. Uh, we went to court to try and stay in the, Euro in the European economic area, uh, which obviously failed. And then obviously when, when that seemed like it was a dead end and that no one was listening to us and that it was, you know, we were being told that we were traitors, uh, enemies of democracy, enemies of the people, um, that people had voted to leave, uh, leave means leave. Then we kind of went, well, in that case, let's try and actually stay, give people a second choice, a final say in this. And so I kind of think those arguments will be relitigated a bit now about do we accept the mandate of Brexit? Um, it's very unlikely that we could rejoin the EU. I don't think the EU necessarily wants us to be in immediately. But a single market could be a halfway house. And freedom of movement might not be the political hot potato that it once was. In fact, we know it isn't. You could argue that it's not a political hot potato it once was because the issue has been resolved. Or it could be that people just aren't that troubled by it anymore. And that's something that we don't yet really know. So it could be, you know, the argument in 2024, uh, there's a very good there's every chance that we could be talking about free movement in a much more open and positive way than has been discussed in the last couple of years. And that's kind of where I think the argument is heading. But as I say, I don't think you can make concrete projections at this time. Thank you, Jonathan. Tony, can I ask if you've got anything to add? Sure. Um, no, Jonathan covered a lot of the, the bases there. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's going to be intriguing to see if there is going to be a cumulative effect of all of these negative stories. I mean, if it turns out that these are not actually teething troubles, but actually structural realities that are going to be there, uh, you know, come what may for years to come. Um, 
we don't know what that's going to do to the British economy. We don't know what, what it's going to do to politics. I mean, people who are really um, acutely affected, who've lost their jobs, who've lost their businesses, who, who've lost customers, where, where do they go politically? Um, you know, that, that's, that's a whole new realignment, which will be fascinating to watch. But I think possibly dwarfing all of that will be what happens with Scotland. Um, you know, a, a Scottish independence referendum or a, a bid, um, you know, the, 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 so much would be at stake with that um, in terms of, well, obviously the result of the referendum, then if the immediate domino there would be Northern Ireland, I mean, if the raison d'etre of unionism is is the union with, with, with the United Kingdom, but if the United Kingdom is now fragmenting, does that devalue that whole notion of unionism? And of course, we've seen surveys recently, Not not there's no sea change in favour of a United Ireland, but there's certainly a growing momentum towards wanting some kind of referendum or border poll within five or 10 years time. Um, and that's being reflected in, you know, the rise in support for the Alliance Party, for, for the Green Party. Um, and the government in Dublin is trying to kind of carefully manage that whole beast. Um, on the one hand, trying their best not to destabilize the very fragile and raw state of Northern Ireland, but also keeping one eye over their shoulders on, on the huge rise of Sinn Féin in the um, general elections recently. So, you know, we're, we are going to see a, a tremendous state of flux um, that will kind of be churning away um, in the foreground. And it, it's kind of hard to see where, you know, Britain rethinks or reevaluates its relationship with Europe in the background when all that's happening. Um, I mean, clearly an independent Scotland would, would be very keen to join the EU. Um, you know, what, what would that mean for, for Britain and its long-term relationship with Europe? Um, I mean, I think some of the issues that Jonathan mentioned, you know, joining the single market, I think it, it's, you know, even, you know, speaking as an outsider to an extent and, and being Irish, but li living in Brussels, um, I mean, I think it shouldn't be forgotten that the entire Brexit story has been seen through the lens of the Conservative Party and a kind of a hard faction within the Conservative Party. Uh, they've kind of owned and dominated that whole space uh, for 10 years. Um, but like, what happens if there's a Labour government in a couple of years' time? Like, what options do they have if they're just seeing misery around them and uh, lots of companies going bankrupt, lots of small and medium businesses really suffering um, the whole Brexit uplands are just not materialising. I mean, who knows what, what's, what's going to happen? So it's, it's very hard to predict. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know some, very often the questions are impossible. Um, and just from a very personal side is we've been trading with some customers in Germany for 14 years. And yesterday was the first day I couldn't um, ship an order, not because of tariffs, but because of non-tariff barriers. Um, and it's likely to take us about three months to get that resolved. So, yeah, we're feeling it very, very personally as well. Um, so if I can pass over to Joe now, who has a next question, which I think is on a slightly different topic, but still very much at something we all feel very strongly about. Thanks, yeah. Joe. Yeah, very definitely a very pertinent question. Um, it's from Alia Cornish, who's fairly well known to us. She's fairly recently taken over as CEO of the Irish Baroque Orchestra, and she now lives full-time in Dublin. So her question is, <clears throat> the government's blame game and complete failure around protecting freedom of movement for musicians is nothing short of a catastrophe. Do either of the speakers foresee this changing anytime soon? The sector has already been deeply hit by COVID and desperately needs freedom of movement in the EU as part of its recovery. And if I could put that question to Tony first, please. Yeah, I mean, there's been uh, two two different versions of that particular story. Um, I mean, the EU's version is that they did offer a standard mobility uh, package for journalists, artists, musicians, uh, sports people that they offer to America, for example. Um, but the UK was not interested. They 
kind of stalled during the negotiations. And then they tried to bring it in through the back door of the services sector, which uh, is not the way things are normally done. The UK government sort of disputes that, but that's that's where we are. Um, you know, I, th- I think if the UK wanted to, if there was enough political will and pressure, they could negotiate an arrangement with uh, the EU on this. I mean, this is the thing. The two entities are going to have to get on with each other geographically. They've, they've no choice uh, in, in years and decades to come. There's nothing to stop them making some future agreements that might um, that might help people. Um, again, at the moment, the... It's up, you know, if if you are going to tour, then you will need a, a, if you're going to be paid when you're on tour, which I imagine you would be, then you're going to need a work visa. But it's up to each member state. Um, Different member states have different rules. There's no single EU visa. Um, So uh, the question is, would would individual countries really demand a a visa for a, a band coming to play in their capital? Hard to say, but again, that's no use to the to the bands. They need to know what's going to happen. They need to be prepared. There's the other thing about cabotage, which is means that a a tour bus can only make two stops for, from the UK in, into the EU, and they, they can't they can't go from one country to the other on a tour bus. So they'd have to hire a, a, an EU tour operator. So um, yeah, but all all these things are again, you know, just pure results of the of the UK's position in the negotiations. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if they, if they have the uh, political will to change it. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? I think I agree with, uh, with Tony that it comes down to political will ultimately. I mean, you know, if the UK was to go to the EU and say we want to be in the single market and the customs union, I mean, obviously they might be taken aback, but you know, it's, these things are doable. Um, you have the, we're still, we're still aligned at the moment. Uh, technically, you know, you could have a negotiation with the European Free Trade Association, uh, you know, where Norway, Iceland, uh, Switzerland are. Uh, you can negotiate entrance into that. Then you can en- negotiate your entrance into the EU single market via EFTA. You can negotiate a customs union in the same way that Turkey has. You can negotiate a better customs union. All these things are possible um, if the political will is there. The EU ultimately wants the UK to be in its economic orbit. And even better if the UK doesn't get actual a seat around the table to make decisions. That's a perfect situation for the EU, actually, because the EU can, can sort of make decisions for the UK and the UK has to implement them. So, of course, if the UK were to kind of try and uh, negotiate something, there would be interest in the EU. It's in everyone's interest for there to be a close relationship. And the EU has obviously always been interested in freedom of movement. So, uh, yes, but, uh, you know, I just don't see that being the political situation at the moment and the UK government thinks it's powerful enough that it can basically um, send people to the wall because it knows it won't hurt them politically, which is the sad truth of the matter. Yeah, it seems that they're doing everything in their power at the moment to upset, annoy the EU, uh, whatever they can. Um, uh, thank you very much for your answers. I'll hand you back over to Peter for the next question. Hello, the question for both of you. In fact, um, the Northern Ireland issues have been I think very prominent uh, among our questions and quite a few people have asked the questions which Tony has given an answer already which is how do you see the future of Ireland and uh, will a uh, reunification occur at some point but I wanted to focus particularly on a question from Angela Hegarty um, in in Derry Um, and uh, she says in the end both Remainers and Leavers are going to have to live together and reconcile. Aren't there any lessons in the Northern Ireland peace process uh, for that? She says Brexit has divided and sectarianized Britain as partition did to Ireland, in my opinion. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Starting with Tony, maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's an interesting uh, angle. I mean, uh, yeah, it, I suppose it shows you the extent of the polarization in the UK over Brexit. Uh, if, you know, we're now comparing those um, antagonisms to the sectarian situation in Northern Ireland. Um, and yeah, I mean, entirely predictably, the, the Brexit debate broke down on sectarian lines in Northern Ireland. By and large, I mean, there, there were obviously many unionists who, who didn't support Brexit. But as time went on, it has become completely retrenched and polarised. Um, 
I mean, the, the Northern Ireland peace process was a long time in the making and it was an extremely painful and grueling process. And there were real historic on the ground specificities there that there were, were just historically unique and required a, an extremely unique um, solution in the Good Friday Agreement. And that, that was an extremely finely tuned and finely balanced agreement that, and that's why Brexit was so destabilizing because it was a fragile peace and a fragile agreement that was not really able to withstand the shock of, of Brexit and, and what that would do uh, to the, the border situation. Uh, and that's why the Irish government was so adamant that it, it had to protect the gains of the Good Friday Agreement and, and protect the, the all-island economy and the absence of a border. And the EU largely took that on board and fought Ireland's corner in the negotiations. Um, and, you know, the, as a result, the Irish border is still open. But the problem is the border has been pushed now to the Irish Sea. And that just means you have displacement of, of the discomfort and, and pain to, to the unionist community and uh, obviously to the business community as well. Um, so that, that's all going to be, uh, that's going to have to be carefully managed. So I'm, I'm not sure if there are any direct parallels um, between reconciling unionists and nationalists in the Good Friday Agreement and reconciling remainers and leavers. Um, I mean, the, tr the trouble is that with, with the Good Friday Agreement, you know, they, they found a, a solution whereby people didn't get everything they wanted, but they could more or less live with the outcome. Brexit doesn't do that. Um, you know, the UK has, has kind of rammed through a hard Brexit. Um, and and that, that's something that has kind of really surprised diplomats and people I speak to in Brussels and, and in the Irish government, that after the result, there, there was no attempt by the British, by the, by the victors to understand the, the, the suffering of the losers um, or, or to have a, a grand conversation about what Brexit should mean. Instead, it just became an extremely antagonistic fight uh, to vanquish the opponent. Um, and now the opponent has won and everybody's paying the price. So that, that's, that's a kind of a totally different sort of settlement, if you like. Um, so it's hard to see the parallels there, to be honest. Um, I agree with everything that you just said, Tony, and it's extraordinary that Northern Ireland and Scotland did not give their consent to Brexit, and there was no kind of attempt at national consensus building whatsoever after 2016. It was the UK government, or specifically Theresa May, dictating the red, white and blue Brexit, which she thought should, should, cap should happen, and of course she didn't even spell that out. Um, for about two years. And it's completely extraordinary that um, the, the government didn't even acknowledge that there was a problem, potential problem with Ireland and the, I, the, and the border um, in, on the island of Ireland until uh, sort of late 2017. And there was kind of no acknowledgement of the reality of the situation that if you are going to erect a customs and regulatory border, then that has to be enforced with some kind of infrastructure. And it was just a, a blanket denial by the British government, which is, I think, unprecedented that the UK government has existed, has denied the reality so boldly uh, in front of it. Uh, I mean, it was really stark in 2017 that uh, Brussels cared more about Northern Ireland than London did, quite nakedly so. And that Theresa May didn't begin to engage with Northern Ireland in any way until she had to bribe um, 10 hardline units to keep her in power. Um, so that was kind of, you know, another kind of disgraceful episode in British statecraft. Um, in terms of comparing Brexit to the Troubles, I mean, I like to think that Britain is not in a state of civil war. I mean, we need to do need to put this in perspective, I suppose. But one lesson that you should have learned from uh, the Good Friday Agreement is a lesson of power sharing. This is a very narrow majority in favour of Brexit. And that that calls for compromise and consensus and unity and as we've said, it was instead a game of winner takes all, uh, the winner takes all the spoils. And that has left us in a profound state of division and turmoil. 
And, um, you know, never forget that it was the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who, you know, likened a border which claimed the lives of 3,000 people to the boundary between Camden and Islington. This is a man who does not care about Northern Ireland, let alone anything else uh, that isn't himself. So uh, I think that, you know, Northern Ireland is, it's on its own course. We don't know what it is, but it's if, for people who genuinely care about the union, um, and I think that Northern Ireland should be allowed to decide its own future just with Scotland and Wales for that matter. But for people who care about the union, I mean, I just don't see it surviving um, in the in the long term, maybe not even in the short term. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to ask if possible, the question from uh, Lizzie Price. Um, I don't know Lizzie, whether you'd like to ask the question yourself? Sure, happy to. Um, well, we've just touched on it really. Um, um, I, I agree with you, John, that, you know, people, you know, they should be able to um, decide their own um, future, um, the devolved nations, really. Um, but we're told today in the Times, there was a headline in today's Times suggesting that we, and we refer to as Wilding Remain, as many of you will have seen it, should focus our efforts to fight against an independent Scotland. But campaigning against independence for the devolved nations seems to me to condemn both of the devolved nations to a tone deaf and corrupt Tory government languishing outside the EU and why would we want that for our fellow citizens so I'd be interested to hear both your both speakers views on you know the likelihood of the independence and and where we should stand as Remainers on this point um well look I mean it's I was passionately in favour of Scotland staying in the Union. Obviously it wasn't, I'm not Scottish, I didn't have a vote. I was up there um, in Edinburgh on the night of the referendum just to kind of see what was happening. And I found it absolutely fascinating. I was convinced that um, Scotland was going to vote for independence because all of the flags he saw were, were salt eyes. And I saw one Union flag the whole day. And that in a way is quite telling. Like the excitement was all on one side and it was a kind of the, the majority was on the other side, but the majority seemed much more passive, cautious, less enthusiastic. And now you have that, but it's been exacerbated because um, you now have a very firm majority and a consistent majority in favour of Scottish independence. And I, if I was living in Scotland, I would probably vote for independence, to be honest, um, because having seen the naked contempt of um, the UK government, from the last five years, you kind of think, why on earth would you want to be governed by these people in perpetuity? Um, why would you want these people to take your fate, to take your fate, um, to to come to disregard everything that you want, to not to give you a crumb of consolation, not to meet you in the middle anywhere, but just to impose decision after decision on you that come rampantly against your interests, and then afterwards say, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dare leave, would you? It's an abusive relationship, frankly. And I, I can completely understand why Scottish people would want no truck with it. Now, obviously, there's a, you know, there's a there are plenty of economic arguments in favour of Scottish Scotland staying, and they might win out. You know, the, the UK single market is Scotland's biggest market. You know, economically it makes sense. People in the borders will be very hard hit by Skexit, so to speak. Um but, you know, we're, we're living in kind of uh, times where, you know, you have to say, well, you know, Scotland um, should uh, make, its, make its own decisions and um, that it can't necessarily, that the UK is declining, rapidly declining, and Scotland might seek to kind of to take a different course. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Sarah Murphy, and it relates to uh, patriotism that's being used by our politicians to entrench their power rather than to represent our best interests. Flag waving is becoming the su suppression of the opposition. How do we stop them from commandeering national identity in this way? That's an easy question, I'm sure. Um, Jonathan, perhaps if you'd like to start. Uh, well, patriotism is, I mean, I was thinking of a quote that John Carey said about sort of the difference between nationalism and patriotism is that nationalism needs enemies. 
Um, but patriotism can also re require enemies as well, if you think about it, about the, the way that kind of patriotism, the way that certain people are kind of delineated as patriotic and unpatriotic. And I think there's so much to unpack. As I'm planning to write an article on this very subject in a couple of weeks' time about how we kind of, people are kind of to condemn for not being patriotic uh, when they kind of disagree with the kind of the uh, kind of the, the political movement in a way that people are condemned as being undemocratic for opposing a democratic decision. You know, sort of a democratic opposition recast as opposition to democracy, which is like a very clever trick um, that the Brexiters have pulled. Um, I absolutely think there's, you know, of course there must be a space for uh, patriotism to reclaim patriotism, just as there should be a space in our national discourse to say, actually, I don't love my country very much. I am, this is my country, but I actually don't love it. And at the moment, that is completely taboo. So <laughs> you can't say that at all. If you say that, you kind of exclude yourself in the debate. You know, the first, you know, you're, you're, the, the entry into the debate is saying, I love this country as much as you do. And that's kind of a, a very broad philosophical question to address about why we need to say that all the time. Why, why should we love? Should we love something even when it's unlovable? As you might, I'm afraid, argue about Britain in many ways at the moment. Um, but yes, of course, there has to be, we, we need to uh, reframe the debate, which is saying that patriotism is not mythologizing, it's not harking back to the past all the time, it's being brutally realistic and honest about the country. You benefit nobody by telling lies. And you, you need to be open about your limitations as well as your potential. And once you do that, then you can begin to have an honest conversation, which is inclusive, recognises history, and this kind of intersects with the Black Lives Matter movement, about the statues being taken down, all the people who were complaining about the statue, who's saying, you know, you don't whitewash history. You need to actually accept that history, you know, that we need to have a very honest conversation about Britain's past. Uh, it's not just, it's not just a story of greatness. And that's, I think, also key to understanding. And on that note, I really recommend a book which I just reviewed this week called Britain Alone by the journalist Philip Stevens, which kind of traces Britain's foreign policy since 1945 about how it has isolated itself from the world um, for, you know, for reasons of sovereignty and prestige, the same arguments that come up over and over again. And to be really patriotic, it has to be about engaging with the world not seeking to lead it, but being constructive in a dialogue. And that still is difficult for uh, this idea of British exceptionalism. Thank you, Jonathan. Toby, can I ask if you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I mean, patriotism and nationalism mean, mean different things to different people. I mean, the, the people who stormed the capital were loudly proclaiming themselves as patriots. So these labels get sort of shifted around and I mean in Ireland a nationalist simply means you, you want to unite Ireland um, whereas nationalism in Europe has a somewhat darker uh, connotation. Um, I mean of course the EU people who praise the EU say it, it's a sort of post-nationalist organization it's it's meant to dilute the worst excesses of nationalism through uh, super nationalism and agreed institutions and everybody shares sovereignty in order to have uh, stability and peace and, and a you know a single market and so on um, but you know we, we, li we live in extremely turbulent times and labels can shift very quickly and identities can shift very quickly I mean just picking up on Jonathan's points about Scotland um, I mean, one, one thing that Brexit has taught us is that uh, issues like identity can quite easily be more important to people than economic well-being. Um, and that's going to be a tricky argument if there is a Scottish referendum, because Brexiteers would say sovereignty and identity is more important than economic well-being. So <laughs> it's hard for them to suppress that kind of argument by Scottish nationalists on the other side of the border. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think in general, you know, we are in for a turbulent 10, 15 years with all of these ideas about patriotism and nationalism and where, where things fit 
in, in the wider scheme of things. Can I just quickly add just to about this whole Scotland thing, which I forgot to say in my earlier answer, is that there are, there are two really important things, um, additional things with Scotland. The first one is that this might become the story of the next five years. So if um, Sturgeon wins a big majority, which I think she will in May, um, then the clamour to have a second referendum will be immense. And she'll also have a huge, not only a domestic mandate, but domestic pressure from her own party, that if she has won this mandate, she's not going to see it through, then that's her political future at stake as well. And so we kind of take it for granted in this country that we have political stability all the time. But Spain is a politically stable country as well. There's no reason in theory why you couldn't have a Catalan style crisis in this country if the Scottish people have given their, have asked for a referendum, which will be five times in national elections. The SNP has won an absolute majority. You know, three general elections, two Scottish Parliament elections. What more? How else can the Scottish people request a referendum other than by voting for the party, which has a referendum as its overriding manifesto commitment? So if that's not granted, then we have real strife potentially in this country with an unofficial referendum, for example. The second thing is, which I think is a really long-term problem, is that the Scottish people have already checked out of the union. That's really important. So when you talk, when you look at the polls, Scottish people want to leave. So this, with their, their hearts have already made their minds up. So if you have in that referendum campaign a very, very kind of project fear for a better phrase, campaign, which emphasises the hard border in Scotland, which emphasises the ruin of Scottish businesses, you know, brings up the sterling issue again, and Scotland narrowly votes to stay in the union, you will, it will be seen as a kind of blackmail, that the Scottish people don't want to be in the union, but they've kind of been forced into it. And that is not a recipe for a happy country. And I also don't think it's sustainable. So those are kind of problems that we're building up for ourselves in the, in the generation to come. Just like, you know, you might argue that the, the settlement with the EU is unsustainable economically, the, the settlement with Scotland might be unsustainable politically. Mm. Yes, thank you both. I think it's a, um, I think somebody once said, things are likely to get a bit ugly as we go through the year. Um, jo, I think you have the next question. I do. Um, we have slightly touched on it before, but it would be very interesting to have a more full answer even so. Um, it's from Andrew Headley. Um, how serious is the UK diplomatic insult to the EU by its refusal to offer full diplomatic status? What reaction can we expect if there is no quick U-turn from this government? And that will put to Tony first, please. Sure. I mean, I think it is uh, serious in that it it's gets things off to a bad start. You know, uh, the UK had an opportunity to show a little bit of good faith and generosity. Uh, although people might say it's, there's nothing generous about it. It's, it's what the UK, as Jonathan explained earlier, it's what the UK had expected as a member of the EU. And uh, it's now the only country in the world that doesn't give the EU full, full rights. I mean, as, as with everything else, when you when it comes to this government and the sort of the, you know the hard Brexiteer mentality in the government, you know you have to suspect that something else is 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 at work here, um, some other subterfuge uh, or, you know I, I'm I would be very surprised if if there wasn't a, an attempt here by the UK government to get leverage on something else. You know okay you ease your border restrictions on SPS and we'll give you your full embassy. Uh, I mean that. That transactional approach was was entirely at work in the Northern Ireland Protocol, the the Joint Committee meetings last year, and and that overall agreement. So so that that's very possible. The other way to look at it as well is that um, the EU, the UK, wants now to strengthen bilateral relations with individual capitals. You know, doing deals or getting understandings with Paris or Berlin or or Rome or whatever. Uh, and, you know, taking the focus away from, from Brussels and, and channeling the relationship through Brussels. And member states are very wise to this. And there was a meeting of EU ambassadors last week where quite a few member states said 
they absolutely want to avoid that. If the if the UK is dealing with the EU, it deals with the EU, not with individual member states. So if you somehow downgrade the EU embassy in London um, to 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 give it a lower status to the bilateral embassies, then that could be what's uh, what's going on there. But it, it you know it's a bad it's a bad start, and I, I don't think the EU is going to get. Um, sort of vocal and to sort of kick up about it, but they, they, they certainly want it to be solved, but they're not going to uh, get into a sharding match. Uh, I, I don't think that's their style at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd say that I agree with everything Tony said, and also the EU doesn't respond to blackmail. I mean, if there's one lesson from Brexit, which obviously the UK government has never learned any lessons in the last five years, but one lesson they should have learned is that the EU doesn't respond to that kind of tit-for-tat transactional transactionalism, if you like, and that it's the UK is not going to secure, you know, some kind of cakeist exemptions uh, for rules it doesn't like uh, in return for giving the EU full diplomatic privileges. I mean, that's that's a nonsense. Um, it's, you know, again, the UK bilateralism is just another attempt to divide and rule, to kind of play member states up against each other. That was a tried and tested and regularly failed uh, tech tactic over the Brexit period. It won't work now either. The UK has none of this, no leverage really to pull. It's, you know, it's played its heart, it's played its cards. And uh, the winner did take it all and it was a loser. Um, so um, the, the really important thing, I suppose, in all this is the UK has never really understood the foreign policy clout of the EU because the UK was never paying attention. You know, when I was um, with the European Parliament and the Foreign Affairs Committee, you would have uh, prime ministers, foreign ministers from all over the world coming to um, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament to talk to MEPs. You know, we would have ambassadors you know, foreign ministers coming to our office all the time. And, and that is a, a level of access that is unimaginable for a backbench MP and really unimaginable for the British Foreign Affairs Committee as well and part in our parliament. And I think that the UK, again, because it always has considered itself superior to everyone, and it's always said, well, we're the, you know, the, you know, the, the Rolls Royce here, it simply didn't understand that people were going to Brussels before they were going to London. London was being downgraded uh, and London could have chosen to be part of that and it chose to kind of separate itself off. And, you know, David Cameron, uh, very, you know, significantly in the Crimea crisis and the Ukraine crisis, chose to leave it to France and Germany to sort out. It's one of the first big, you know, European crises where the UK has not been around the table. So that was kind of a, 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 the rot beginning to set in even then in 2014. And I think that the UK still hasn't learned the lesson that it's not a big foreign policy player in the same way it was, and that the EU is, like it or not, the EU is a foreign policy actor. And the irony is, is that the UK was responsible for that foreign policy agency. The, the UK um, helped set up the common security and defence policy, uh, which kind of, uh, kind of developed from an Anglo-French agreement. And the UK enthusiastically endorsed uh, many of the EU's overseas missions. It contributed um, staff to a lot of them. Uh, so you know, the UK was, was reaping the benefits of that foreign policy um, action um, by kind of amplifying its voice, you know, because the UK had the, the history, the EU had the strength, and the two of them were actually very useful for the, the UK. Obviously, that's no longer in the UK's armory. Mm -hmm. It sounds quite tragic all around, actually, doesn't it? We don't seem to have learned any lessons at all over the last four years of negotiating. Um, I'll hand you over to Peter now for the next question. Hello, hi, thanks for that. Um, I think on the same theme to some extent about the uh, leverage that the UK has and the retaliatory, retaliatory power of the EU. Um, if Britain does uh, scrap, for example, um, any um, employment rights, as they are now threatening to do, uh, what's the likely response in terms of retaliation that we expect from the EU? Uh, I, th I think the EU will definitely want to respond if they feel that there, there is, a, you know, a grave, tangible divergence that puts European companies at a competitive disadvantage. You know, I, th I think that's that's certain, and that's baked into the treaty. That's the that's what the whole level playing field issue was about. And, and, you know, I have to say that that was an extremely strong um, 
principle that that member states embraced and 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 kept hold of throughout the negotiations you know they they, they absolutely wanted a good trading relationship with the UK, but not at the expense of the single market. There was no way the UK was going to be this manufacturing hub on the uh, Western seaboard, um, undercutting European companies. So I think the problem is going to be, you know, how, how do you quantify the, the, the danger that, um, or the damage that divergence can do? I mean, if, if the UK has different parental leave regulations to the EU, how do you kind of crystallize that into a kind of a quantifiable damage to a particular sector? Um, but the EU is going to be looking out for it. And, you know, that's in a way, that's why getting back to the embassy issue, that's why the EU is quite sore about that, because you know, they're going to need a strong presence in London to make sure that they can monitor what's happening in the Euro in the UK economy to make sure that they can identify any areas where divergence is going to be problematic uh, for the for the EU. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to go after one more question because I've got to be on our nine o'clock news in about 25 minutes time. So, uh, you know, maybe one more question and then I, I can leave it to Jonathan. And I have no, I have nothing to add to what Tony said, by the way, that's it. Yeah, so just, um, thank you, Tony. And just, just really one question, whether the answer is this quick, is um, currently Keir Starmer is the only show in town as far as being able to remove Johnson from power. Does the panel believe he is playing his hand well? Um, well... Tony first, if I may, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, sorry, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, like it's it's very hard to disentangle Keir Starmer and the Labour Party from just the awfulness of the past five years and how you know, like you know, the British political centre is is kind of a wreck uh, after Brexit. Like all the normal rules of you know, winning votes, getting ahead, building a consensus, building a base. I mean, they've all been turned upside down by Brexit, and you know, clearly the Labour Party was in a very difficult position, you know, instinctively. I think the Labour Party was obviously a party of Remain, but you had the whole Jeremy Corbyn factor, which kind of complicated that. And then you had Boris Johnson winning an 80-seat majority, and they're trying to come back with that. You've got the problem for Labour of uh, Scotland. I mean, can, can they win a majority without Scottish MPs? Um, I mean, you know, the Labour Party has been dealt a, a terrible hand by history in the past five years. And, you know, they, they've probably played that hand badly uh, in, in some uh, occasions. But um, I think Keir Stammer is, you know, he's a credible threat to Boris Johnson. And it'll be very important to see how Labour capitalises on that discontent that we talked about earlier. If there's this kind of gnawing discontent among small businesses, people who trade with the EU who just get fed up and suddenly they're starting to see the emperor with no clothes and you know they're going to look to a leader, they're going to look to Keir Stammer, I suspect, as, as someone to try and you know fix things. How that all evolves politically, given the real and divisions over Brexit and the fact that people, I mean, people are so exhausted by Brexit that, you know, Keir Starmer can't really say, well, I'll fix it by bringing us back into the single market. I mean, I think that that's a very treacherous path for him in the short term. And I think he's going to have to play a very, very long game uh, to get into power. And uh, um, I'll, I'll have to... Um, uh, withdraw from proceedings, but I hope you keep the debate going in my absence. Well, Tony, can I, can I just say on behalf of all of us, before you go, that and it's been fantastic and we're extremely grateful for your input and hopefully we'll be in touch. You, you, you knew Knoxville well, maybe you'll come and talk to us here face to face when time is right for that. But uh, I, I, yes, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, I've, I've had a few invitations to speak at the university um, on Brexit. And of course, I haven't been able to you know, realize any of those invitations, but if, if it happens, I would love to come and uh, meet you all in the flesh and uh, uh, take a trip down memory lane in, in Oxford and Abingdon, where I lived. So, uh, 
anyway, it's, it's been a pleasure and uh, great talking to everybody and uh, best of luck in the coming months. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Thanks. thanks, and thanks, Jonathan, as well. Uh, Jonathan, can I ask you the same Keir Starmer question? Is he, is he playing his hand well? Well, it's interesting that Tony used the word treacherous um, because he would be accused of treachery, of course, if he were to uh, advocate any kind of harmonisation by the right-wing press uh, of whom he is terrified. Um, so, yes, he is... I hate to use the term long game because I uh, notoriously used a very an article in 2017 talking about Jeremy Corbyn's clever long game. And that kind of returned to bite me a few times. Um, so, yes, it is a long game. And it's a necessary long game because he doesn't need to play that hand now. He doesn't need to... If you were to say now, yes, I think we should have free movement. Yes, I think we should rejoin the single market. It would be... It would be the ammunition that the Telegraph, the Mail, the Express and the Conservative Party would need to beat him with for the next four years. He wouldn't be allowed to talk about anything else. So to keep his powder dry is, is no bad thing. There is no, there is no chance, really, of us going back into the single market with this Conservative government. It will only happen with a Labour government. So that's kind of... We have to have a Labour government. Now, we simply don't know, as I said earlier, what the conversation will look like in 2024. If there is a movement, if there is a kind of, uh, if the, the terrain is right to rejoin the single market, then maybe that's something we can discuss. Maybe it's something that would come into, you know, come into the conversation in the next parliament. It really depends on how Brexit works, about how migration uh, sentiment works, about what where Starmer thinks the red wall is. Obviously, they're much more important than people like us uh, politically, who he thinks, that he, rightly or wrongly, that he, whose votes he can count on. Um, I think he's doing, you know, I was disappointed with a lot of the things that he has done over the last year on Brexit. I wrote many articles saying he should be talking about Brexit. He should be fighting for a deal. He was very passive about it. When the deal came, I said he should have a say on it. He didn't. So I'm worried that Labour might be kind of given ownership of the deal um, when its failings are revealed. But the counterpoint to that is that uh, it's very hard to explain to the British people why you'd abstain on a deal. Um, the, the Labour Party was so riven by Brexit, had to see to put it behind it. It said that we don't agree with a lot of this, but this is a Tories deal, but we don't support it because no deal is worse. And it has to hope that that just doesn't come to haunt it in three years time. And I simply don't know if that will happen, but I absolutely do not give up hope on Starman. I think that he stands an excellent chance of winning the election. Um, and we simply don't know who his opponent will be, let alone what the issues will be at that time. Thank you, Jonathan. Somebody's just pointed out that it's past half past eight. Um, but there is, if I can just build on that, then it's a question that's sort of coming in or or a plea that's come in from lots and lots of people um, is on the basis of what we've just said is what do you think that organisations such as Oxford for Europe can actually do um, over the coming months and probably years in terms of of the of the long game um, to try and change the change the outcomes out here. So, so again, back to your crystal ball, if you can. I'd say keep fighting for what you believe in. That's all we can do. Um, we may never get back into the EU, but we can argue the point. We can show demonstrate to people the advantages of being in the EU, the disadvantages of being outside it. Uh, we can show people, um, we can give people a vision of the future that we want to see. And that's all we can ever do. You know, maybe we won't convince people as we failed to do before. And that's the fact of life. But I think that there will be a moment one day, inevitably, where there is a, a movement, a mainstream movement for being in the EU. You have this organisation on your doorstep, which is not going away anytime soon. Um, and there will be people, whether it's in five years or 10 years or 50 years, who will say, we should be in this. None of us knows when that moment will come. And we don't know if it ever will actually happen. But there needs to be a history of advocacy stretching from now to that point um, from which the movement can draw on. There has to be a continuity. We can't just shut up shop for 10 years until the moment is there. The moment will only come if we put in the groundwork every day until that point by making the same arguments, by trying to convince our neighbours and friends. 
And uh, that's all we can hope for. And electing people who agree with us. And right now, the Labour Party, as you say, the Labour Party is the only show in town. We have to work for a Labour government, in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Can I hand over to Anne now? Thank you. Thank you very much. That has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I would have liked to say thank you to Tony, so I will say it in his absence, um, and to Jonathan. You've both given us a great deal to think about. Um, <clears throat> most of it, uh, well, uh, I, I liked your, your, your last little um, bit there, giving us some hope. Don't give up hope. Uh, and uh, even if, you know, we're not going to be back for 50 years, we have to be building on it. And I note today in the New European that um, there's, a, there's a headline that's saying that the EU is planning to launch a campaign to teach younger Brits about the EU. So it sounds like the EU is kind of going to try and slide under the radar. And of course, uh, our younger people are the ones who are going to want to get back in. Um, uh, uh, and that may come sooner rather than later. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Jonathan for your time and to Tony in his absence um, <clears throat> for giving us such a really interesting talk on behalf of Oxford for Europe itself and for all of those who joined in, who I'm sure would all like to uh, agree with me. You can all wave if you like to thank Jonathan. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> Everybody wave. Um, uh, and, uh, 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 and I would just like to um, pass over to Peter, who I think is going to tell us a little bit more about f uh, future meetings. Thank you, Anne. Well, first of all, just to, to say it's really been inspiring and it's been wonderful to, to hear this. I know a lot of it is, is uh, not happy news. I think much of it um, we had suspected, um, but there's still a note of... of confidence about the future and I think we need to build on that and uh, thank you Jonathan and thank you um, in his absence to, to Tony. I'd like also to say a special word of thanks uh, to Anne as our chair um, and thank you for chairing the meeting so, so efficiently. Um, just in terms of uh, future meetings um, we, we have currently um, one speaker booked for the 1st of March which is Terry Ranker who's uh, um, a Green MEP from Germany who's oh. been very much involved in UK affairs so hopefully uh, you'll want to look out for that one. Okay. Um, then uh, other speakers we have lined up for future meetings uh, include um, Lena Moran, our, our own MP, um, Richard Corbett and potentially Alex Andreo. So look, keep, keep, your, keep an eye out on this space, keep an eye on our, on our um, website and Twitter feed and that information will be available uh, to you. Um, so that really is the uh, only thing I was going to say. And uh, just thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to now uh, allow people to unmute themselves. And if you want to um, unmute yourselves and uh, give a round of applause to, uh, uh, to Tony in his absence and uh, to Jonathan, and thank you. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.